Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, final session of Data Science PhD training uh, this academic year. Today, we will talk about dimensionality reduction, uh, answering uh, the key question, should we reduce dimensions uh, or not really? So let me, uh, so it will be uh, up to one hour because uh, after me, uh, Will uh, Jeff Kotloff, a PhD student, will give um, a shorter talk uh, about uh, his research. Right. So uh, less than one hour today. Okay. So first, I would like to clarify uh, two uh, different concepts that uh, are often confused. So projection versus embedding. So first of all. Uh, uh, What's the problem here? The problem is that uh, most data is uh, given in terms of long vectors, and these vectors can be considered as points in a high dimensional space. So of course, it's hard to look at uh, points in any uh, dimensions more than three, and it's very tempting to uh, reduce uh, this dimension to smaller numbers, usually two or three. So when uh, we consider a map from a high dimensional space, so M, here is higher than the uh, lower dimension n, so from a, maybe a subset A to uh, a subset B, then <clears throat> this map is often called, or actually should be called a projection, because it's simply an analog of uh, an orthogonal projection, say, from the plane to the x-axis. Right? So this orthogonal projection is an example, and uh, any map from a high dimensional space to a low dimensional space can be similarly called a projection. Uh, another word which is often used is an embedding. So actually this concept is from topology. And topology it is defined uh, as a homeomorphism on image. So I decided not to write this long word and uh, read on the explanation, but it is a bijection which is bicontinuous in both directions. So bijection on image of this map. So for example, <clears throat> you could uh, say embed a topological circle as a round circle or as an ellipse. So all these are closed curves, the lots of intersections are different embeddings of the same circle. Or even simple example, if you have a usual scalar function G, say on the real line, then uh, you can consider the graph of this function as an embedding. Of, uh, of the real line to the plane. So following the values of our function. So that's an embedding. So it goes from lower dimensions to usually high dimensions. Well, <clears throat> what's the problem in formally? So in formally, uh, we have um, two dimensions, m, which is much larger than m. So that simple means that m is uh, really high and n is relatively small. So we'd like to find a projection from a much higher dimensional space to a lower dimensional space, uh, usually dimension two and three, but somehow preserves or saves the structure of a given subset uh, as much as possible. So of course, this is a rather informal statement because uh, the word structure here requires clarifications. But uh, as an example, uh, we could be interested in preserving distances between points. So of course, uh, this, uh, this is not realistic. And uh, previously, we discussed some examples. Say, um, four points in a three-dimensional space, um, for simplicity, uh, with all interpoint distances equal to one. So how could, we, how could we visualize this set of four points with interpoint distances in the three-dimensional space? How, how would it look? Four points in the three-dimensional space, all interpoint distances one. Is it easy to imagine? It's not in the plane in the three-dimensional space. Mm 
leave three in one dimension, maybe take one out of a dimension. Right. If you have three dimensional space, three, right? Then four points, say general position in a three dimensional space, form a tetrahedron. Right? Yeah. And if all interpoint distance is equal to one, this tetrahedron is simply equilateral. Right? Equilateral tetrahedron. Uh, but if you uh, try to project with four points to the plane, then we cannot get four uh, interpoint distances equal to one. <coughs> but tetrahedron cannot be flattened while preserving the distances. Right? So, of course, we cannot save uh, all interpoint distances, at least in, uh, in all cases. And uh, so there are several here, um, obstacles for. Um, with dimensionality reduction, that could be formalized or explained with examples. The curse of dimensionality is a well-known uh, idea in computer science. So briefly saying that our intuition stops waking in dimensions higher than three, sometimes even higher than two. You will see why. Then I, I will briefly talk, briefly actually mention only uh, popular dimensionality reduction algorithms that are stochastic. And also uh, mention deterministic, deterministic algorithms. Uh, and at the end, hopefully, you will have a better idea how to answer the question uh, whether dimensionality reduction is really possible or not, and uh, what can or what should we do with high dimensional data. Okay, curse of dimensionality. Well, since this is a PhD training, uh, I am trying to uh, ask some problems. <coughs> So specific questions. So imagine we have the n-dimensional cube so in the, the coordinates in the range uh, minus one, one. And we uniformly choose the random point on this cube. So it means we have uh, n coordinates and every coordinate is, run, is a random number between minus one and one. What's the probability that uh, such a random point has a distance more than one from the origin? So in, uh, in the plane, you could imagine but uh, square on the interval minus one, one, then uh, around disk, so around disk, around the origin of radius one inscribed in the square. Dimensional case, any suggestions? Yes. Well, it's just the, uh, the volume of the um, cube, which is one. As I don't know if it's got side length two, has it? Yes. Um, so the volume of that, which is eight, uh, subtract the volume of the sphere of radius uh, one, right? Okay. Uh, so you which you subtracted four yeah, no. thirds pi. Say again. Eight minus four thirds pi. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is, is it the probability? Is it your answer? Uh, I'm sorry, no, 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 that's, that's just the area, isn't it? And then you'd have to sort of scale that to the divided by eight, I suppose. Okay, so could, could, could you roughly estimate the oh, probability? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the exact answer is, uh, it is also half, simple. Is it? Say again? Half or a little bit more? more. Uh, a little bit less than a half. Yeah, very good. So the exact answer is actually one minus pi over six. But uh, let's uh, let's discuss it uh, starting from the simpler cases. If dimension is one, then our one dimensional disk simply coincides with the whole interval, right? So the probability will be simply uh, zero. So every point is at the distance one. So if probability probability zero, we cannot get away uh, from the origin. Dimension two. So in dimension two, who, who can give the answer? Four minus pi. Is it probability? Divided by four. So one minus pi over four. Yes, one minus a quarter of pi. That's correct. So this is uh, briefly the explanation. So let me highlight here the difference. Uh, so I'm talking about two-dimensional disk whose boundary is a one-dimensional circle. 
So that circle has a length, but no area. Okay, so we distinguish disks and circles. And similarly, three-dimensional balls, which are solid objects, and uh, boundary spheres, which are two-dimensional. So for, uh, for the ball, uh, there is actually a formula for the ball, so unit ball here, in any dimension. And gamma here denotes the so-called gamma function. So gamma function is a, is a bit complicated object, but uh, it also has an explicit formula. So it can be computed by, by this formula exactly. <clears throat> and then when we substitute this volume, when we uh, compute this volume, say for the three-dimensional case, I hope you remember that uh, three-dimensional ball has the volume for thirds of a pi, and that's why the probability uh, to get a point outside the ball is uh, about 50%. So it's nearly one half, nearly every other point is uh, far away from the, from the origin. So distance one from the origin in one of the corners. Okay, so one over uh, one minus pi over six as uh, we computed uh, previously. So how about the high dimensions? Can you guess what will happen with high dimensions with this probability? It will increase and increase, I suppose. Really. Yes. And what is important, it will increase and increase very quickly. So if, if you write down the formula, <clears throat> well, it can be uh, formally proved that this ratio of the unit vol volume over 2 to the n, which is the volume of the cube, converges to zero. But uh, even for uh, small enough numbers, it's already nearly 70% in dimension 4, and in dimension 8, almost every point, so close to 99%, uh, almost every point is in the corner of our um, uh, cube. So that's why if you if generate points randomly uh, from, uh, from, from such a cube, then almost always we get points uh, away from, from that central ball, which sounds a bit strange. But that's, that's the basic geometry. So the ball is actually not shrinking here, but the relative volume, yes, is shrinking to zero quickly. Uh, so that's the uh, one, one illustration of first of dimensionality. Yeah. Yeah, yes. So you said the uniform uh, random choice is probably not very meaningful, yeah? concentrated outside of the ball. Yes. How about the grid search method? Uh, grid search, uh, so you mean uh, we, we select um, so coordinates with discrete values? Yeah, discrete values with the same step. So if, if these discrete values are dense enough, if our grid size is small enough, then um, uh, this sampling is close to uniform sampling. Uh, although, if you would like to do it exactly, then uh, there will be a um, complicated um, problem in discrete geometry counting, for example, the number of um, points with integer coordinates within um, a circle of a given radius, so-called Gauss problem. So it's non-trivial already in the plane. That's so strange to think about, though, mm -hmm. that you would just pick a point that was... doesn't make sense to me. I know we've just shown it, but yeah, you're absolutely right. So that's why our intuition is simply not helpful in as you see in any dimensions higher than three. Mm. Not even three is fifty percent. Yes, it's fifty percent already uh, three dimensions. Okay. <clears throat> now let uh, let me mention the TSNI algorithm. So S and E here stands for stochastic neighbor embedding, and T means some technical um improvement of this uh, earlier S and E algorithm. So this is a very uh, popular uh, paper, at least by Google citations. The key idea is to uh, minimize 
uh, a cost function which was initially uh, so called callback library divergence which is uh, a non symmetric distance so it doesn't satisfy even the symmetry axiom for a metric but uh, if it is additionally symmetrized then apparently it becomes better so that's one of the improvements in comparison with the uh, previous s and e algorithm however um, the algorithm itself, uh, itself remains um, requires optimization. So it requires several parameters for this uh, optimization, stochastic optimization. And that's why <clears throat> it's non trivial to produce optimal results. So there are no guarantees. But the main motivation for this algorithm was to um, improve the previous approaches, but output uh, that often produced so called. Uh, uh, dense clusters in uh, in the center of our data set. So let, let me show uh, practically how uh, it looks for the data set, database of NIST. So these are uh, grayscale, uh, small grayscale images of uh, digits from zero to nine. So on, um, so grayscale of size 28 by 28 pixels. And here, uh, this is the output of TSNI only of 10% of the database. So it might look like clusters here so are well separated by, um, by with labels, ground truth labels. However, you might see so a lot of uh, a lot of false negatives and false positives when the points are in the wrong clusters. So even even uh, looking well, uh, very standard to these clusters, like this um, digits six inside the red cluster for zero. But indeed, uh, there is no concentration around uh, around around the center here. So this is, this is simply an example. Now, since we are talking about NIST, let me um, let me remind you uh, more specifically that. It's, it's an early database from the 80s, maybe the first well-known and at last time probably the largest image database. It, it looks like it's 60,000 grayscale images. <clears throat> How, uh, is it a large number? What do you think? 60,000 images of uh, sizes 28 by 28. So size is small. And I suggest, I propose what we estimate quickly uh, how many uh, possible grayscale images of these sizes we can produce or conceive in principle. So, um, uh, as a hint, so the beginning of this problem, I remind that grayscale value uh, is uh, one of uh, 256 values, so from 0 to 255. Right? So any pixel can have one of these values. And uh, how could we um, then compute the total number of possible images if you have not one pixel, but 28 squared pixels? Well, you just multiply two to the power of eight by 28 by 28. Say again. Uh, so you the number of pixels. multiply 256 by the number of pixels. Yes. Okay, uh, maybe a simple question then. If you have a, an image consisting of only two pixels, yeah, uh, two, two, two is a bit too small, uh, four pixels. Mm. So four pixels, two by two, say. Then uh, should we multiply 256 by four to get all possible images of size two by two? So you force the power to oh, okay. For the, for the first pixel, which is six power four. Again, so Henry, yes, yes, so yes. two hundred fifty six yeah. to the power equal yeah. the number of pixels. The number of pixels is twenty eight squared, right? And I even don't compute it explicitly. I prefer to keep everything uh, with simple factors. So the total number of images is the product of all these independent choices. 
256 choices for every pixel. So this is two to this power, which I uh, propose you estimate quickly. So rewrite it in the form 10 to some power. Can you actually guess approximately? How, 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 how much is it? 10 to the power. What, so what, what's the exponent here? So your guess. Two to the 10 is approximately 10 to the three. So. Any wild guess about this exponent? It's about two to the power of five hundred or so, so it would be like ten to the one fifty. One fifty? Hundred fifty? Any other guesses? Oh, sorry, one thousand five hundred fifty. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Okay, okay, you're closer, you're closer. So, ah, so let's compute it. <clears throat> well, more exactly estimate it. So, you see, uh, as you see, I replace here 49 by 48 only to make all numbers simpler, right? A little bit, a little, a little bit smaller, lower bounds. And then um, replace with 2 to the power 10 by uh, 1000, by 10 cubed. And as a result, we get a low bound estimate, so it's it's a low bound. It's ten to the power one thousand eight hundred. How much is this number? The number of atoms in the whole universe is estimated uh, by chemists as ten to the power eighty only. But the number of grayscale images of uh, rather small sizes, twenty eight by twenty eight, is much larger. What does it mean? It means what a Lamnese database of uh, 60,000 images covers a really tiny proportion, tiny fraction of that huge space. I suppose you're not going to just going to get any random image there, are you? Right, that's right. I have even inserted the exact comment about that. But most images are not random. However, there are already too many real images in, uh, in such vast spaces. So if you can consider, if you can consider, say only four pixels as I initially suggested. So already for four pixels, the total number of images will be more than four billion. Well, only for four pixels. And now you could argue that well, yeah, for four pixels almost everything can be realizable, yeah, right? It's a very, it's a very rough approximation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, so that's that's the problem with, uh, with the dimensions. So curse of dimensionality in the in the, now in the discrete form. Now you map. So that's the next algorithm. So this is uh, similar in principle to TSNIM. So stands for uniform manifold approximation and projection. And actually, the underlying paper is still in the archive, not published. So it also has a lot of citations and it's written in a more theoretical language uh, and some assumptions are explicitly uh, specified in the paper, so as you see. However, um, many concepts are, are used uh, rather informally. So for example, again, this topology. So this locally connected, this concept actually means uh, geometric connectedness up to um, up to a certain threshold in, in small neighborhoods. So it's, it's not really topological, right? So although the paper looks theoretical, the, um, the real realization is, uh, is very uh, dependent on gain on many parameters. So I, I learned about UMAP when uh, my previous uh, past um, former PhD student, uh, Cameron Har Cargreaves, uh, used it uh, for uh, visualizing the space of inorganic composition, so that's why I give this reference. But luckily, at least we used in this paper the proper metric called f inverse distance, which you have seen previously in our sessions. So, in uh, so briefly speaking, this is also an optimization algorithm, and more importantly, it is stochastic, so similarly to a TSNI. 
Stochastic means that if you run it on a different machine, uh, then the output can be different. So more exactly, it depends on the so-called seed. But also, um, but also if uh, <clears throat> if you uh, perturb the data or maybe even permute original data points, not really changing the, the database, the output could be different because of this stochastic nature. Okay, so now we are moving to uh, deterministic algorithms. Uh, so this is a uh, motivation or illustration of uh, principal component analysis. So when we have a noisy cloud and would like to uh, understand where the signal is hidden in such a noisy cloud. So when it is, uh, when the signal is uh, elongated uh, along one direction, then it's very natural to assume that um, but uh, there is a linear dependence between two coordinates x and y here, but because of noise, so only because of noise, uh, we see not a straight line as would be ideal, but um, a perturbation of that straight line. So that's a so, sort of deviation uh, in the orthogonal direction. So, uh, so one way is to uh, consider that signal to noise ratio, and sometimes it's helpful to, uh, to find the signal when, uh, when the signal to noise ratio is large enough, as in this case. But uh, of course, we could have uh, simply a random noisy cloud when um, almost any direction is, uh, is possible. And it means that we cannot really reduce uh, or make some coordinates redundant. So in, in, in this case, we could say what R2 could be ignored because it's almost linearly expressed in terms of R1. So that's why it makes sense to reduce the dimensions to R1, but, um, but not always. <clears throat> so how could we do it naively? So in the previous pictures, uh, you see that we were looking for a, a vector where uh, we had the highest, so highest variance. So the highest variation in our data along a specific vector. So we could find such vector. So imagine, for example, you have found such vector. And then after finding this vector, then the next uh, potential vector, if you're interested, say, in two-dimensional projection, is um, could be orthogonal, again, with the highest variance orthogonal, orthogonal to uh, the first vector v1. So we ignore everything. Project, project it to V1 and consider only an or, uh, the second orthogonal projection. So that's why a key idea of principal component analysis is to find uh, these directions one by one, uh, or more exactly uh, find directions that uh, diagonalize uh, the sample covariance matrix. So since our uh, session today is short, I, I decided not to include um, technical details, but um, the limitations of PCA can be uh, can be explicitly written down. So it works when the data is indeed uh, close to a linear subspace in the high dimensional space, for example, close to a flat plane in um, in a ten dimensional space. So and also so-called sufficient signal. How do you know that? Sorry. <laughs> How? You never know, but yeah, what's the problem? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will we'll give examples <laughs> in a minute. <clears throat> of course, of course, uh, these assumptions um, cannot be really checked, so we can only hope that uh, what they hold. But uh, one advantage of principal component analysis is that it is a de deterministic method. So if you run it on another machine at a different time of, of a day, the result will be the same. Mm -hmm. So it's not stochastic. And at least it's, it's explicitly justified. So it also minimizes some cost function, but minimizes it optimally. So it's not an iterative algorithm. It's an exact algorithm. Finding some minimum, global minimum. It's just whether or not it's appropriate. That's yes. sort of subjective. Yes. Well, the previous uh, methods are also subjective, but at least this one is mathematically justified. 
if the conditions are satisfied, of course. Really. Okay, one practical example again from NIST. So this picture looks nice uh, um, because, well, it's it's a specific example, so a specific database, which is actually not very large in the space of all possible images. So we are projecting a rather small cloud to um, a few, one, ten, or several principal components here by code. So that's why that's why uh, they look reasonable. Uh, there is a slight extension of PCA called single value decomposition. And since it is a little bit, uh, since it is also geometric, I illustrate illustrate the uh, idea of single value decomposition here on, on that picture. But is the point with that last one that it was a good one to do it for because they look roughly the same even when you only take one principal component? For this database, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for another database, we may not know. Yeah. So it's just helpful with the images because you can actually see the image and see whether it still looks like an age. We can't see the image. Uh, the computer sees still a matrix of numbers, so mm -hmm. these grayscale values. And this matrix becomes, well, blurred, mm -hmm. right? So for us, yeah, we are uh, very good humans at recognizing patterns. So we recognize what it is still good. But for computer, it becomes worse because all these numbers will become blurred, so not so sharp mm -hmm. as in the original images. That's why it's a very, very useful tool to reduce the image size, sending or for, for archiving or zipping of some storage. Mm -hmm. Whilst for automatic recognition, it might create problems. Yeah, so we simply lose, yeah. but briefly speaking, we simply lose data here. Mm -hmm. But I, I suppose I'm just like, after, how do you assess whether the data loss is sort of, like whether it's worth doing or not? See what I mean? Well, in practice, usually it's how it has been received. Yeah, you remember mm. the old style images, they essentially relied on that method. Yeah? Mm. And at some point, uh, some sort of cropped image that mm. we received by some kind of social apps mail mm. was just unsuitable. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's how it worked. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, SVD, um, SVD uh, roughly speaking, transforms or represents any linear map W so in, a, in a simple form. So a linear map given by matrix can be rather complicated. So here with linear map, maps are very simple, um, say around disk to what ellipse or over. So the idea here is to, uh, is to simplify this map, this linear map in the following form. So first we make a rotation to, um, to put our uh, given object, for example, that noisy cloud into, <clears throat> into a better form with respect to coordinate axis. So that, uh, for example, the main direction would be along the X axis. So rotation. <clears throat> then, uh, then uh, our linear map becomes really simple. As you see here, we simply scale every uh, coordinate vector by its own value. So it's non-uniform scaling, but the linear map is diagonal. It's rotation, diagonal scaling, then another rotation back. So you see, we have decomposed any linear map, any matrix into two much simpler into three much simpler matrices. So that's the key idea. And this, um, well, principal components were actually hidden here in, in this decomposition. So it's called singular value decomposition. That's the general idea. <clears throat> now, uh, let me also mention one more algorithm, which is called a mapper, because it came well, from topology, so that's why I know it uh, a little bit. <clears throat> The, uh, this company, IST, which um, uh, developed uh, this algorithm for the market actually no longer exists, it, um, but the algorithm is still considered uh, in, in 
research. So the idea of um, mapper is to improve, for example, PCA from <clears throat> for, for the cases when our data is not really linear. So if you have a dense sample of flat uh, closed curve, looking like an ellipse, <clears throat> then uh, principal component analysis would produce a linear approximation, so one straight line through, uh, through this ellipse. So we would lose the site. And the idea of mapper is to uh, make uh, clustering first locally, so split our cloud into uh, smaller clusters, and then um, look at overlaps of these clusters and connect connect centers or representatives of these clusters in a graph, which is called the mapper graph. So this mapper approach is a um, natural extension of clustering to one dimension up to when we connect uh, clusters um, by links and we can get a graph. And similarly, in high dimensions, we could get also more complicated simplicial complexes when we, uh, for example, add triangles to, um, to these points. So not only edges, but also triangles. Okay, so in all these uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms, when you see an output, so this one, the previous one, so in all these projections, the key question <clears throat> that uh, people should ask, uh, or actually really ask when they see uh, such maps, well, what are the coordinates? So if we projected uh, uh, 10 dimensional space to a plane, two dimensions, what are these two dimensional coordinates? And this is a hard question to answer, uh, especially for stochastic algorithms. So in principle, uh, this algorithm would also output uh, these coordinates in some uh, explicit formula, but this formula will be very complicated. And, and it depends. So all, always uh, this formula depends on, uh, on, on the parameters that were manually tuned even for the fixed data. The, pro, the advantage of deterministic algorithms such as PCA is that these coordinates are, have mathematical definitions. So they are not explicit enough, but we could say it. we could somehow uh, define formally what is the first principal direction. So it's the direction of maximum variation in our data. So this is a formal definition. However, similarly for practical data, even if you write down this uh, coordinate explicitly, it will not look nice at all. So it will, it will have a complicated formula, not easy. So that's why, <clears throat> yeah, let me uh, mention uh, now examples when <clears throat> uh, PCA uh, produces simply strange, strange results. <laughs> in, in the first picture, you have points in a three-dimensional space, so X, Y, Z. And these points uh, came from a circular dyn dynamical system. That's why you would recognize what they are uh, probably uh, uh, around a closed curve. So there, is, there is a hidden uh, topological circle here. So the uh, output of PCA here is shown by these two vectors, so two red vectors, which look uh, rather random. Yeah, this is the long vector is the fat direction direction of maximum variation, and then that's the orthogonal second direction. But this is probably not the best um, dimensionality reduction for that cloud. The best reduction uh, could be achieved by one uh, angular parameter. If, if you know in advance that like this is um, a circular object. If our points uh, now in, in the plane, so only two coordinates, x and y, if they are not linearly distributed, for example, sampled uh, from a union of two different lines, then the first line might be captured by, uh, the, by the first principal direction. But the second orthogonal direction will, is simply missed. So it, it, it doesn't capture the second line at all. Or uh, in, in the third picture, when we have uh, this heart-like uh, shape, so a noisy cloud, uh, so humans would be easily uh, would easily draw uh, two directions describing this um, uh, this non-trivial cloud, but PCA produces uh, very different directions. So simply trying to somehow average uh, 
average uh, all directions into this first long one and then the perpendicular one. So what's the problem here? The problem is that uh, we're using simply two uh, little data or more exactly two weak invariants to describe our data. So specific examples. Uh, this uh, covariance matrix that is used for um, PCA, it contains only four numbers. Yes, these four numbers uh, are invariants. So uh, if you translate or rotate our cloud, the numbers will remain the same, but four numbers, of course, cannot describe all possible point clouds. That's why very different point clouds uh, shown in these examples, they have the very simple identity covariance matrix, all of them. So it shows the incompleteness or weakness of the covariance matrix in the uh, PCA dimensionality reduction. Any questions? So that's that's one underlying problem of um, PCA. So, but there is, uh, there is a bigger problem. So uh, we have discussed specific drawbacks of past algorithms. Is there any better algorithm? So people are still uh, thinking about uh, how to design a better algorithm. And unfortunately, there is a serious mathematical obstacle to all uh, of these attempts. So the problem is the following. <clears throat> Uh, so Lang Weber, sorry, um, Lang Weber, who is uh, actually a well-known mathematician, well-known topologist with several authors, um, recently enough in 2017 proved the following very simple theory. So even, even the proof is rather simple and accessible, say, to students in undergraduate topology, undergraduates in usual topology course. So I will not give a proof, but the statement is also uh, very simple to explain. So imagine we consider, we, we try to find um, a new dimensionality reduction um, algorithm, so which is a projection from Rm, oh sorry, that's a typo, uh, where a second dimension should be smaller, so it should be a small n, and here in we have only strict, any strict inequality, for example, even from 3 to 2, so any any uh, dimension, uh, any reduction, even by one. So any such map, so is proved to be either discontinuous, and discontinuous means what if you have close points in that high dimensional space, then they could become not close at all. They could become distant in the projection. That's roughly the uh, meaning of discontinuity. So either such a function is discontinuous, and we would be interested, of course, in continuous projection that reserves similarity of points. So if this map is continuous, then this map should prove should lose an infinite amount of data. In what sense? In, in the sense that there is an unbounded region, so a big region in the initial high dimensional space, that maps simply to a single point. So all this big and bounded domain is mapped to a single point. So this situation is very similar to the standard of polygonal projection. Say, you can see the plane and project everything to the x-axis. The basic example, x, y maps to x. So what happens on this projection? Any vertical line maps to a single point, right? So all points on the vertical line, they could be far away from each other, but they are mapped on the projection to a single point. Yeah, because the projection is very simple. But actually, the same, the same conclusion holds for any continuous function from high dimensional space to low dimensional space. So there is no way to avoid that, unfortunately. So what does it mean? It means <clears throat> that low, uh, low dimensional projections can can be uh, helpful for visualization. So, of course, we like pictures, so it's nice to look at pictures. But we should not use these projections to lower dimension subspace for any rigorous analysis, especially about similarity. So, if uh, two points from high dimensional space are projected to very close points in low dimensions, or even to the identical point, it doesn't mean that they pre-images 
with high dimensional space were identical or even close. They could be far away from each other. So exactly in the same way as in the vertical projection from the plane to the x-axis. So this theorem from 2017, yeah, proved it. So that's why <clears throat> when we see a low-dimensional projection, so first uh, we should ask what's the meaning of coordinates. And even if PCA can give, uh, can explain the definition of these coordinates, <laughs> even in this case, we should not uh, make conclusions about similarity by using only the projection. We should use the similarity in the original high dimensional space. Will it make points that it won't make points that are distant and sort of seem close though, will it? Or could it potentially? Of course. So, so imagine the vertical projection, orthogonal projection from the plane to the x-axis. Yeah. So any points, any distant points on the vertical line. They map to a single point on the axis. Oh, sorry, I, I meant the opposite. So, like points that are close, will the projection ever make them distant? Sorry. <laughs> like so. So, if we were to visualize in a smaller number of dimensions, the fact that they're close is sort of like a minimal condition, but it, it won't show two distant points of being close together, will it? Distantinos. Isn't it I just mean like, well, so in your example of the x, y plane being projected, which is just x, if you had two points that are, um, are sorry, very close or very close together in x, y, then when they're projected, they will also be close. If the function is continuous. So yeah. that's exactly yeah. the meaning yeah. of continuity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it could be stated in different forms, but roughly speaking, if points were close in high dimensional space, when the continuous projection should keep them close mm. under projection. Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, so I suppose it, it just shows that it warrants further investigation uh, if you're looking at points that are similar in this projection. Yeah. Yes. Which is not necessarily true. Uh, yeah. But if, it sort of lowers down the options, really. Right. If our points under continuous projection are distant, so they become distant in the projection. Mm. Then they 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 way distant in the high dimensional space. Mm. So that's the continuity. So that's why it's a useful property. So at least at least we have something <clears throat> rigorous in one direction. Mm. Okay. So but that's quite useful because if you were to analyze sort of nearest neighbors in some sort of sense, it would rule out a lot. Yes, it's yeah. it's for filtering out not yeah. nearest neighbors. Yeah, yeah. So if points of very dis different projections, well, initially they were also different. Yes. Same motion as the plant. Well, exactly, yeah. Continu this is what we're talking about. Continuity. Yeah. So this is a continuity property. That's why it is important, mm. actually. OK. <clears throat> right. Uh, so let me show again two examples from the previous picture when we have a very complicated problem. So it's about periodic crystals and a very large database, Cambridge structural database of, uh, so here we show about uh, seven or 800,000 uh, real experimental crystals projected to two explicitly defined coordinates. <clears throat> so one of them is density, well known to uh, material scientists. And another one is new, so this is one, uh, average minimum distance to the first atomic neighbor. So it is a lower dimensional projection from a high dimensional space, but the coordinates are easy to define. So not even abstractly, where the formula is simple. Yes, uh, we see what is uh, a concentration around some cluster in the middle. Uh, and this is actually natural. It, it's actually important to see such clusters because at least uh, at least position of this place means what our um, our crystals uh, are common. So many many crystals have uh, have density around this value and average minimum distance, which is basically the uh, first <coughs> bond, the smallest bond length uh, between um, atoms in molecular organic crystals around this value. So it's important to understand 
where this invariants uh, have common values. However, since we cannot see many uh, many crystals here separately, we could zoom in at, at a small cluster here and look at this uh, small uh, black dot in other coordinates. So that's why it's important to have more coordinates. So not only not only these two, but uh, a longer sequence, ideally going to a complete invariant. But of course, pro a projection will uh, collapse uh, some of them or many, many of these crystals to the same spot here, only because our coordinates are very, very simple. So this is actually the same database uh, where you see only one cluster because we removed hydrogens and, and now, now these two clusters merged. But um, an illustration of why <clears throat> Why we can look at every uh, dense spot here is um, the description of uh, common crystals that appear in the database many times. So near duplicates uh, determined with uh, slightly different uh, coordinates or other conditions. So, so here we, we can look at the specific spot and explain what, what is going on there. So for example, so at this spot, yes, we, we can find all crystals at that spot and see that they are really similar in that high dimension space. So not only become identical angle of projection. Okay, yeah, finishing, finishing on time. So uh, the summary slide. So in, in conclusion, so any dimensionality reduction is a projection so not an embedding, but a projection from a high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space. So many popular algorithms are, have uh, stochastic nature, meaning that they can output different results and different machines, different runs. <clears throat> maybe even, yeah, also importantly, uh, many of these uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms use so-called non-convex optimization, which means that there are no guarantees, theoretical guarantees, that this optimization finds a global minimum. It usually finds an approximation to some local minimum, and we cannot be sure whether this local minimum is global or whether it is not a shallow minimum, whether it is deep or not. And more importantly, there is a, a real mathematical obstacle here <clears throat> that either any such projection is discontinuous or simply loses data. That's why mathematicians use uh, projections uh, for nice images, yeah, to, to insert a nice picture into a paper. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely fine, but we should not use uh, this low dimensional, uh, dimensionality deduction images projections for rigorous analysis, especially about uh, the similarity of data objects. However, it doesn't mean that we cannot work uh, or should not work with high dimensional data. We simply should do it different. What we should do is to uh, analyze this data in the original high dimensional space. So we should design invariants with continuous metrics in that high dimensional space. And when you have these invariants, then of course you can project them, say, to a couple or three of these invariants, so different pairs, and look at this high dimensional data through different projections where all coordinates have meaningful and simple enough analytic definitions. So in this way, in this way we are not uh, losing any data and everything remains explicit. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Any questions? <clears throat> Any questions? I'll, I'll stop the recording.